All right, just make sure we're live on. Okay, great. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, happy Sunday. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, welcome to the session. Thanks for coming in. Um, to join us here for uh, our 41st uh, live sacred space session. Uh, I'm honored to be with you here in this time of sensitivity uh, and uncertainty, as always. Uh, and I look forward to uh, sharing time with you in our shared sacred space today. Uh, so the things we'll do today in our shared sacred space together is number one, we'll uh, set our sacred space. Uh, number two, we'll have our kind of topic, uh, uh, topic sort of discussion uh, of the week. And for the past uh, several months now, uh, we've been doing a fairy tale uh, read, selected and read by Gary, uh, my editor in Bangalore. And um, and then we kind of have a reading sort of, you know, brainstorm reflection on it afterward. And we'll do the same uh, this week as well. Uh, and the topic this week will be a fairy tale um, that leads us into a reflection around how to find your inner truth, how to find your inner truth. Uh, after that, we'll have a bit of an exercise uh, suggested that you can do um, uh, this week between now and the next session, uh, and then we'll close sacred space. Okay, let me just make sure the sound and everything appears to be working. Uh, and okay, all of that seems to be working. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, um, and set sacred space. So what we would like to do here in this space together is to create a space which is devoid of fear, threat, and control uh, in order for us to be able to open to higher guidance uh, from within our own inner selves. Uh, however we define that, it could be uh, intuition, a higher power, uh, a sort of collegiate sort of collaborative power uh, the muse, um, just sort of random, brilliant flashes of insight, however you, you think of that. Um, and to do that, we would like to have a safe sanctuary space where we can all relax and surrender uh, with no danger or fear of threat or any of that, uh, so that we can partake of the emotional nourishment uh, and spiritual nourishment that comes from being in sacred space together as a group. And in opening sacred space today, I will propose that we all follow the four principles of Presidian sacred space. Number one is confidentiality. Uh, typically when we do these groups in person, uh, it's standard Vegas rules. Uh, what happens in sacred space stays in sacred space. <laughs> uh, and here, uh, because we're online, because the stream is public, open to the public, because the replay will be public, open to the public. <clears throat> We can't, strictly speaking, have confidentiality. So what we do instead of confidentiality is anonymization. Uh, so the way you would do that, if you would like to be anonymous, you don't have to be anonymous. Uh, while you chat, ask questions, which you don't have to do either, you can just sit and listen, is you would come into the Crowdcast uh, feed, uh, go into your user profile, edit profile, and change your username to Mickey Mouse or Harry Potter and then continue anonymously from there. So confidentiality slash anonymization number two is no threat or controlling, no fixing, no tough love. Um, so this is a space where uh, because it's sacred, we let go of fear, threat, and control, regardless of the intention. So even if um, I'm saying, no, 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 you should try this program, you should try this diet regimen, you should try this uh, this this book, it'll, it'll fix you right up. Uh, come on, come on, right? Or, or pushing or intervening, even for your own good, even with good intention, uh, we don't do that here, right? Uh, not that that's wrong, right? The profane is not bad. The profane is just profane. And in the realm of the profane, the laws of physics of fear, threat, and control are in play, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in order to have a kind of, you know, non-clenching, sometimes in order to clench really well in the profane, you need some time where you can safely stretch out and you know exercise and uh, 
you know, get treatment, get conditioned, feel safe, so that you can clench even more tightly and go out and, and win the day where you need to win the day, right? That's not technically why we do it, but um, the point is there's nothing wrong with profane, there's nothing wrong with sacred, sacred but they are different. So when we are in sacred space, uh, no threat, no controlling, no intervention, no fixing, no tough love. Uh, oh, I only, I only, you know, mean the best for you. That's fine, uh, but we don't do that here. We do that later in profane space, uh, if at all. So here we're holding space for each other to be however we actually are, uh, to be afraid, to be anxious, uh, to be happy and relaxed, um, to feel fine about how we feel, uh, to feel guilty and uh, reeked with shame about how we feel. Uh, and however we find ourselves, even if we don't have the words to describe how we find ourselves, um, to know that whatever it is, it's okay. It's okay. That's the safety of sacred space. The third principle uh, is a corollary to the first two, which is no commerce. All right. So in sacred space, nothing may be sold uh, or recommended or suggested, even if it's free. So I can't sell you anything. Gary can't sell you anything. <clears throat> Please don't pedal things to each other here. Uh, even if you're recommending things, oh, I, re I read a good book that will fix that. Uh, there's an implied sort of threat in that offer, uh, a well-meaning threat. But if you know I'm in tough shape and you offer a book, even if I say, oh, thanks, I'll check it out. In my mind, I'm like, well, shoot, if I don't check it out, I may be like the one dunderhead who doesn't get his healing and pain relief. Uh, and even that, however well-meaning it is, is an implied threat. Uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just we don't do that here for this little span of one or two hours uh, on a Sunday, just so we can stretch out and relax a little bit. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, with regard to not, no commerce, we are here, in other words, for your energy, not for the things you bring. We are here for what you are, not for what you do or provide. So, principle three no commerce. Principle four no expectation of participation. So there's no pressure to do anything. You don't have to chat. You don't have to not chat. You don't have to ask questions or not ask questions. Again, the nourishment comes from the held space uh, of your presence and, and attention when you feel like giving it. And you don't even have to do that. It comes from what you are, not from what you do or provide. Uh, you can come and go out of the session as you please. You can uh, promise to watch the replay uh, and not watch it. All of that's totally OK. Uh, and all of us here together in that sacred space will tend to amplify like the power and the, the tastiness of the sacred space for us to take nourishment from. Uh, so this is what I propose. Uh, and if you are not okay with that, that's totally okay. There's no fear, threat, or control for you to even come to sacred space or even stay in sacred space. Um, but just a heads up, we are about to step forward together into this sacred space. Um, so if you're not okay with that, that's totally cool. Uh, we will just give you a moment now to uh, withdraw if you like or to make your selection. Uh, and then later we'll still catch up with you uh, in profane space. Uh, if you're on my email list, I'll, I'll still send you emails. <laughs> and we'll still hang out, uh, no worries at all. So I will just give you a moment now to uh, make your selection. Okay, and so for the rest of us who are still here, we will now move forward together into sacred space. And as we enter into sacred space together, uh, I'll just remind that the four principles we are observing here now are confidentiality slash anonymization, no fear, threat, or control, no tough love, no fixing, uh, no commerce, no recommendations, uh, and no expectation of participation. All right, welcome to Sacred Space. Happy, happy Sunday. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump into <clears throat> um, our topic for the week. And our topic for the week is um, how to find your inner truth. Now, the interesting thing here is we don't come up with these titles and then find a fairy tale to match. Like Gary will just select um, the, uh, the fairy tale she'll bring to me every week on our sort of brainstorm call. 
from her own wild ass intuition, right? Uh, we'll read it, she'll read it to me, uh, and then I'll think about it. And my first reaction is usually like, huh, I don't get this, what, what's the point of the story? Uh, but then we'll sit with it, we will hold space for the story, uh, and then a, a pattern will emerge, you know, I'll start to make associations and, and we'll go from there. And then after that, we look at what we've come up with and we're like, well, what, what is really the theme of everything that's being said here? And then we'll come up with a title. So the title that emerged for this week was How to Find Your Inner Truth. Uh, in the session, our weekly fairy tale brainstorm brought us to a deep dive into what the healing journey looks like after emerging from grief, which was kind of like last week. Um, and then even further towards one own, one's own deeper truth, uh, come what may, right? Come what may. You like find your deeper truth and then you let the chips fall where they may. Uh, so we'll start by telling a folk tale from the Spanish tradition uh, and then kind of let the golden thread take us from there. So Gary, if you are there, um, uh, please come on up on screen. Yes. And we'd love to hear about the story you've selected for us this week. Hi, Hi Gary. Can you hear me? Thanks, thanks for being here. Yep, I hear you yeah. just fine. You look great, you sound great. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. And, uh, yeah, um, it's it's a lovely story this uh, this this week because it comes from uh, you know the, the typical fairy tale kind of a tradition with lots of magic and you know lots of you know witches and giants <laughs> and things like that. So yeah, it's 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 a fun story that I picked up from uh, Andrew Lang's collection of fairy tales. Um, and it's called uh, it's called the Bird of Truth, mm. and I, I particularly love that you have a nice little bird song going on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can hear that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So, uh, will you tell us the story? Yeah. Yeah. I just tell the story then. Okay. Right? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's called the Bird of Truth, and um, and this is you know, about a time when there was a poor fisherman who lived uh, on the banks of a river and had built a hut. And this place was away from the noise of this towns and, and the river just flowed quietly um, around trees. And every morning the fisherman would go and cast out his nets and he would wait uh, for a while listening to songs of birds. And one day as he was doing this, he was just waiting uh, for the fish, he saw on the river flowing towards him a cradle made of crystal. And he quickly reached out to it, drew it out, pulled the cradle to the bank, and then he saw that inside was um, a soft bed of cotton and there were two babies, a boy and a girl. And when he uncovered the bundle, they opened their eyes and smiled at him. And the man felt sorry for them. And he took the babies home to his wife. Now this, this wife of his just put her hands up in despair and said, are eight children not enough that you bring two more home? And how do you think we're going to feed them? And the fisherman said, well, I couldn't leave them out to die of hunger or swallowed up or, you know, eaten up by animals. And, well, if we have enough for eight, I guess it'll be enough for ten. So, and the wife agreed and, you know, she, she felt sorry for them too. So both of them together raised the two children in their hut and brought them up with so much love and care that, you know, it wasn't like they were foster parents. They they looked after them as if they were their own. But, you know, their, their children, their, their real children, had this kind of envious and, and uh, resentful kind of an attitude towards the orphans. And as the children grew up, the orphans noticed often that they would always kind of pick on them. They would play pranks on them. Um, 
so to avoid that, the two children would just go away by themselves and spend hours and hours by the banks of the river. And here they would, they would take out pieces of bread, which they saved from their breakfast, and they would throw these, you know, crumbles to the birds. And in return, as they did this, and they sat there for hours with the birds, the birds taught them lots of things, like how to get up early in the morning, how to sing, and how to talk their language, which, you know, normally humans don't know. And, you know, the, the orphans kind of grew up with all of those skills, but one day they realized as much as they tried to keep peace with their foster brothers, things only got worse and worse. And until one morning, the eldest boy of the siblings told the twins that it's all okay for you to pretend that you have such good manners and you're so much better than we are, but we at least have a father and mother while you only have the river. You're like toads and frogs. And the poor children, you know, felt really unhappy to hear this. They, they didn't quarrel, they didn't reply back. They, they just took the insult, but they realized they just couldn't go on there. So the next day morning, they woke up as early as the birds and they slipped out of the window and then went to the bank of the river. And they were hoping that, you know, eventually if they just kept walking, they would find someone to take care of them. And whole of that day, they kept walking and there was nothing. And finally they, they came to a hut and they felt really good thinking, oh, there must be someone in the hut that we could ask help from but they soon realized that the hut was empty. And there was a bench outside the hut, so they just sat down there and kind of tried to pick themselves up saying, well, at least there's a bench we can sit down and rest on. And we'll think about what to do. And they were tired and just resting. And they noticed that under the tiles of the roof, there were swallows that were nesting there. And these swallows, were chattering to themselves and they had no idea that these children actually understood their language because you know then they might not have talked so freely but it so happened that there was a visitor among the swallows from the city and these were all the kind of forest swallows so they were very keen to hear news from the city so they were asking the city swallow about news about other friends uh, about family and the city swallow was just so eager to chat and, and she was telling them all kinds of stories. And finally, she kind of landed on, on something really surprising because, you know, the forest swallow said, oh, you seem to know a lot of stories. You seem to know a lot of things that go on. And the city swallow said, well, I'm not the kind to gossip, but, you know, I, I do know stories. And, and, and then and that took on a tone where, she said, by the way, you should know that, you know, our king fell in love and married the youngest daughter of a tailor. And this is a story not many people know. So you'd be interested in this. And, and all the swallows just said, oh, do tell, we want to listen. So the city swallow said, okay, so this is what happened. That this our daughter of the tailor was good and gentle and beautiful and the king married her. But the nobles in, in the court resented this because they wanted a queen from one of their own daughters. So they tried to prevent the, the wedding from happening, but the king wouldn't listen to them. He married her anyway. And some months later, a war broke out and the king rode away with his army and the queen remained behind. Now, a few months later, peace was made, the king returned, and when he returned, he was told by these, you know, noblemen and his courtiers that his wife had had two babies in his absence, but now both were dead. And the queen 
you know, in, in the grief of losing her children, had gone mad. And they were obliged to shut her up in a tower in the mountains, hoping that the fresh air of the mountains might cure her. And the swallows that were listening said, this can't be true. So the city swallow said, of course it wasn't true. The children were alive at that very moment in the gardener's cottage. And all the conspirators were in it. And, and at night, they put the children in a crystal cradle and they carried it to the river and let it float on, on the river. And for a whole day, they just floated and floated. And because this, this stream, this river was very still, they were quite safe and unharmed. And in the morning, my kingfisher friend told me that they were rescued by a fisherman who lived near the bank. Now, this is when the children who were lying on the bench just sat up because they realized that this was their own story. And they were so glad that they had learned the bird's language. And they looked at each other. You know, but the swallows were still talking and, and the listener said, oh, this, this was such good luck. So it, it's all okay then. So all the children have to do once they're grown up is that go back to their father and, and tell them that they are, the, they are his children and set their mother free. That's it. The city swallow said, it's not easy as you think because they will have to prove first that they are the king's children and that the mother never went mad. In fact, it, there is just one way of proving this. And the swallow said, how do you know which way and, and what is this way? And the city swallow said, well, I was passing through the palace garden and I met a cuckoo who, you know, sees the future or foretells the future. And she said to me that there were all these things that were happening in the palace or the events of the past years. And the only person who can expose the wickedness of the ministers and show the king how wrong he has been is the bird of truth. Who can actually speak the language of men? And I said, okay, so where can this bird be found? And the cuckoo had said that this bird of truth was shut up in a castle and it was guarded by, by a giant who only sleeps for one quarter of an hour out of the whole 24 hours in a day. And so where is this castle? And everyone was just listening, trying to see you know what 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 more mysteries are there in this and the city swallow said well that's just what i don't know all i can tell you is that it's not far from a tower in which uh, there's an old witch she knows the way so the first thing to do is go ask her but she will only tell it to the person who brings her the water from the fountain of many colors because she needs the water for her enchantments. But, you know, she will never betray the place where the bird of truth is hidden because she hates him and she would kill him if she could. But the thing that, that really prevents this from happening is that the bird cannot die. It's immortal. And that's why she keeps him shut up, guarded night and day, of course, this giant who guards the castle, but also by birds of bad faith who gag him so that his voice can't be heard. And so these country swallows, they were like, so if there's no one who can tell the poor boy where to find the bird, you know, how would he ever do it? Well, you know, there's no one except an owl. So this owl lives a hermit's life in, in that desert where the castle stands. And he knows only one word of human speech, and that is cross. 
And that is the trouble, because even if the young boy or girl succeeded in getting there, they could never understand what the, the owl said. Because that's all the owl can speak, but the owl actually knows the entire story. He knows the truth. And, you know, by this time, the sun was sinking. So then the city swallow said, it's time to leave. And good night. And everyone exchanged greetings and, and the oldest burst. Now, the children by now had forgotten all their hunger and tiredness and everything. And they were so happy to hear this news that they decided that they have to get to the city. All right. And they kept walking. And after a couple of hours, they reached the city, which, you know, looked like the capital. Um, so they figured that this must be their father's city. And, and they found a woman standing at the door of a house. And she looked quite, you know, good natured. So they asked her if you know, she would give them a night's lodging. And she was so pleased with their, you know, nice manners. She said, okay. And early next morning, even before it was dawn, you know, the girl had swept the rooms, the boy had watered the garden. So when the woman woke up and came downstairs, there was nothing for her to do. And she was so happy with this. She told the children to stay with her. And the boy said that, you know, he has some errands to run, so he will have to go, but he can leave his sister with her. And saying that, he he set out. And then for three days, he wandered and wandered, you know, all the out of the way parts, but he couldn't see a sign of a tower. And the fourth morning, he was completely filled with despair, he couldn't find anything, he finally flung himself on the ground and started to cry. And this was just under a tree, so he was just absolutely desperate. And above his head, on the branch of the tree, there was a turtle dove. And she was calling out and watching him. And the boy addressed the dove in her own language and said, I need help. Can you tell me where this castle of come and never go is and where can I find it? And the dove said, oh, you poor child, who sent you on such a useless quest? And the boy said, well, I don't know if it's my good fortune or evil fortune, but you know, I'm on this quest now. And the dove said, all right, if you want to get there, you'll have to follow the wind, which today is blowing towards the castle. So just, just follow that and you will get there. And the boy thanked her and he followed the wind and he walked all day. And finally, he came to a, a country which became more and more deserted and more and more dreary. And there in the middle, he saw a tower. And he realized this must be the tower where the witch lived. And he gave three loud knocks on the door when he reached there. And it kind of echoed in the hollows behind. And slowly a door opened. And there was an old woman who kind of was holding a candle up to her face. And her face was so ugly and hideous that the boy had to kind of back off for a bit. He was almost frightened. And there was a whole troop of, you know, lizards, beetles, and all sorts of, you know, creepy creatures surrounding her. And she asked, how dare you knock at my door and wake me up? And who are you? And the child, you know, he'd come this far, so he had to be brave and talk to her. Said, Madam, I believe that you know the way to the castle of come and never go. And I pray that you show it to me. And the witch said, well, today it's late. So tomorrow but why don't you come and sleep with my lizards? And she had this kind of evil smile on her face. So the boy said, I cannot stay, I must go back so that I reach the road from where I started before I you know, began this journey, but I'll come back tomorrow. But even better, if I tell you now, I mean, if, if I offer to kind of bring this, this jar of, uh, many colored water that you seem to want, would you tell me? And of course, the you know, the witch was kind of delighted with this. 
she said, oh, this this jar full of the many colored water that happens to be in the courtyard of this castle that you want to go to. So if I tell you, you'll bring me this jar full of this water. And if you fail to keep your word, I will change you into a lizard. And the boy said, I promise. And then this, this witch called her dog and told her dog to take this child to the castle, right? So they walked, the boy and the dog. And after a while, you know, they reached this, this castle and there was just this, and everything was completely deserted. And this dog let out a howl and this boy stood there hesitating whether he should go in or not, because he wasn't sure if this is the hour where the giant was asleep. And he was standing by this wild olive tree, which was like the only tree around in the whole area. And suddenly he heard a voice say, cross, cross. And he was so happy because he realized that this is the wise owl that he could talk to. So he spoke back to the, to the owl in, in the bird's language. And he said, oh, wise owl, I, I pray that you protect and guide me because I've come in search of the bird of truth. But first I have this errand. I must fill this jar with this many colored water in the courtyard of the castle. And the owl said, don't do that. But there is a spring close to the fountain of this many colored water. And from this spring comes out clear water, right? You should fill the jar with the clear water. And then you step into the aviary opposite the door. But be careful not to touch any of the bright plumaged birds. They'll all cry to you. Each one will tell you that he's the bird of truth. But go straight to a small white bird hidden in a corner. Pick that bird and you will know it because all the others around that bird will be trying incessantly to kill this bird, not knowing that it can't die. And you have to be quick because this is the moment the giant has fallen asleep and you have a quarter of an hour to do all of this. So when he heard this, the boy ran as fast as he could and he went into the courtyard. He saw this fountain of many colored water and then he saw a spring close by. So he went straight to the spring, filled up the jar with clear water. And then he went to the aviary. And he was almost like there was this deafening noise of, you know, peacocks and ravens and magpies and all of these colorful birds. They were trying to drown the, the voice of this tiny white bird that was sitting in a corner, surrounded by crows that were trying to kind of badger it and and, and bully it. And the boy went straight to that bird of truth, put his hand out, picked it up, put it into his jacket and just ran out. And he went straight back to the witch's tower and he handed the jar to the old woman. And the woman instantly flung the water from the jar at the boy and said, become a parrot. Now, instead of, you know, losing his shape and turning into a parrot, because that's that usually what happened to everyone else who had encountered the witch before, this boy grew 10 times more handsome because he had picked the clear water in the jar and that water was enchanted for good and not for, you know, uh, bad spells and enchantments. And then at the same time, because, you know, she just flung the water, there were all these creeping creatures around the witch who also had this shower of water fall on them. They stood up and became human beings again because they were all enchanted by the witch. So they all turned back into humans. And the witch saw what was happening. She got scared and she took her broomstick and flew away. And so, you know, the boy came back to the sister carrying the bird of truth. Now he'd accomplished so much, 
But now, the more difficult part of the task was to take this bird to the king without being seized by all of these wicked ministers who'd obviously never want to let that happen, right? But it just so happened that, you know, the funny thing about these things is the news spread abroad that this bird of truth was around the palace and the courtiers made all kinds of preparations to make sure that the bird doesn't reach the king. They got their weapons sharpened, they got all the weapons poisoned, they sent for eagles and falcons, um, you know, they, they got cages and boxes ready to shut her up. And they declared that her white plumage was really just fake because underneath it she was all black. And no one was to pay attention to anything that the bird of truth said. So there was all of this going on. And just as it happens, because they talked so much about this, this bird, they actually brought about what they really feared, which is the king finally heard about it. And he was curious and he said, well, I'd like to see this bird. And the more obstacles they put in his way, the stronger his, his desire became. Finally, the king made a proclamation. He said, whoever found this, this bird of truth should bring the bird to him without delay. And he would you know, generously reward them. And, you know, this is just what the boy and, and the girl needed. So the, the twins saw this proclamation, then they went to the palace, right? And the bird was buttoned up in his tunic. And just as he expected, the courtiers barred the way and told the child, you cannot enter. And the boy kept persuading that he was only obeying the king's commands. And, you know, the king wanted him, wanted to see him, but there was nothing doing. And just as they were talking, you know, the bird took the matter into its own hands, flew upwards, went through the open window into the king's room and sat on the pillow. And she bowed to the king respectfully and said, my lord, I'm the bird of truth that you wish to see. And I've been asked to approach you in this manner because the boy who brought me is being held by your courtiers outside the palace. And the king was angry at this and said, what insolence I ordered for this and how can they stop the boy? So he ordered his attendants to get the boy to his, his room. And he met the, the young boy and the girl. And he asked, who are you? And how come you have the bird of truth with you? And the boy said, well, if it please your majesty, I think the bird of truth will explain that herself. And the bird did explain, but told the entire story and for the first time, the king realized this whole wicked plot that had been you know, put into action by his own ministers. And, and he took both the children in his arms. He had tears in his eyes. And he instantly went to the tower in the mountains where his wife was shut up. And the poor woman was just white as sheet because she'd been living in darkness all that time. But the moment she saw her husband and children, the color came back to her face and she was she was just as beautiful as ever. And they all returned to the city and there was great celebrations. And, uh, you know, the wicked ministers had their heads cut off. And um, as for the, the old fisherman couple, they were rewarded with riches and honor and they were loved and respected to the end of their lives. So that's that's the story for today. Hey, Arti. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you so much for that story. That was so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long one. <laughs> was right. I mean, like I said, the last time, you know, I kind of avoided initially that these fairy tale kind of stories because, you know, mm. there's so much magic and there's so many scene changes that happen that it's it's really a long string of of things. But I think, you know, it's sometimes it's just the intuition says, no, it's all right. Just just go with it. So. Oh, totally, totally. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I was totally mesmerized, and I'm now. I'm just like, can we just go? Can, are we done? Do I have to talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm done. <laughs> So tell me, I, I will start with my usual question, which is okay. having just come off from telling that story again, mm -hmm. uh, where do you enter into that story? Oh, it was really the, the title which kind of just, you know, captured me because it's the bird mm. of truth. Mm. And um, I think the, the, the clues in the story, uh, and the story is not very subtle or kind of cryptic, right? It, mm. it it does voice out the exact theme of the story in, in quite clear terms, mm. where it talks about mm. this birth of truth being immortal, that it can never die, mm. and how the bird of truth is kind of badgered by all these other colorful birds mm. so that its voice is drowned out. And, and then there was that theme of how, you know, the bird of truth can speak the voice of humans, Mm. It's probably the only bird that can, <laughs> and <laughs> um, and all of these these kind of um, different aspects of the the truth, so to speak, that we don't really think about on a on a daily basis. But then mm. I was thinking, it's it's mm. when you read that, it just makes so much sense about about our own personal truths. Mm. It's so often drowned mm. out by by unnecessary noise and that's not the outer noise it's inner noise itself and there's so mm. uh there's so much effort to keep that truth hidden for various reasons so that mm. resonated with me and it's kind of you know the whole um the quest to find this this bird of truth uh was mm. And, and the other thing that fascinated me was the whole language of birds thing. You know, mm. there is that skill that you need if you mm. want to find this bird of truth. So mm. what is that skill? So that, that's, that was where I was fascinated. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so I have my notes before I dive in. I just want it to, just, it's just coming to me now to say that uh, for those who are listening, who have done healing stuff with me and us, mm -hmm. uh, one very simple lens to look at this entire story is that this is not an allegory, but a symbol, an archetype, uh, a diorama mm -hmm. of the process of recovering a lost board member. Uh, the Bird of Truth, mm -hmm. definitely a lost board member, but there are multiple layers, right? It's like um, uh, the clear water is a lost board member. The children are lost board members, and you go layer after layer, deeper and deeper. Each layer is a, it's, the nature of the lost board member is is similar in each. But after you go down a complete threesome, right, the the three layers, uh, you come back up to the recovery of the of the children themselves fully. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's just a it, it's a it's a gorgeous gorgeous story. Um, so I, I totally resonate with the language uh, of birds and um, and all of it. And I think that for me in the larger sort of arc mm -hmm. of the stories we've been telling, it, it's really been this fascinating thing for me. Like at some point we should probably do a session where we look at the arc of all the themes across the multiple stories we've done over the last you know, three or four months. Mm -hmm. um, which is something we advise people to do when they do their dream work too. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like dream from this week, dream from that week. And then every few months you do like a list of all the headlines of the dreams from the past three months. And, and this like meta dream arc of the message comes through, mm -hmm. right? All mm -hmm. of these dreams. <clears throat> yeah. So we, we may want to do that at some point. Um, it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> But we may want to do that at some point. Yeah. But just from last week to this week, you know, last week we <clears throat> we stopped with, and, you know, just to note to everyone, there's not some grand arc that we're finding stories to fit into. We're just mm -hmm. following the golden thread of the stories, and this arc is kind of self-emergent, right? And from last week, we had that Cinder Lad story. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
And you know, the theme of that was like, okay, this is a story we think about what happens after grief. And where we left Cinderlai was he was the Cinder King. He had gotten the princess on the glass hill and all of that. And, and we discerned that he was kind of this John the Baptist figure, right? Uh, this Obi-Wan Kenobi, this, this Morpheus figure where his role, you know, the, the archetype of John the Baptist is that he is not the one, he is the one who prepares the way for the one. And so the natural um, question that begs is, well, what is he preparing for? Right? And we had some ideas around that. And this story really kind of, for me, hits that, hits that nail on the head. Mm -hmm. um, because in the previous story, uh, and, and this often happens in dreams, when you have three dreams over the course of a night or a number of dreams over the course of a week or several months, if you read a dream, you know, in the way we've been doing all these things, mythopoetically, you will often find that um, <clears throat> at the end of any given dream segment, let's say the first dream of a three dream series you've had at night, uh, you read the signs and the symbols and you're like, okay, so that, that all makes sense, that's good. And a dream, by the way, never says this because dream is sacred space. Right? What you need to do is, you know, you need to leave that 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 jerk and and uh, go find a new uh, partner. It, it's never prescriptive in that way, right? It's always like, it's never allegorical. It's always like, okay, here's a state of affairs that is so. Uh, just giving you the update, and uh, you know, you decide if you're okay with this, then carry on. No action needed, right? And so, with each dream, it will give you this status update. And then at the end of the dream, there will be kind of this hanging thread of like a question that it like so very in a very subtle way, a question that it begs. So like, so then what about this then? And then you'll find that if you ask that question, if you discern that question, the next dream zooms into that question and answers it. <clears throat> so here we see something similar, right? So. Before we're like, okay, so there's this whole grief cycle. What happens after grief? And we have the whole cinder lad kind of thing. And then after cinder lad, it's like, okay, he's done happily ever after. He's the king, but he's also this John the Baptist like figure because it's St. John's Eve. It's like all over the story, right? He's just hidden in plain view. And the question then is, well, I mean, so St. John the Baptist prepares the way for the one. Uh, who is the one? Uh, and so this question then answers that question of who is the one that John the Baptist is preparing the way for, which is, you know, you can't make this stuff up, right? It's here it is, December 27th. This is the weekend after Christmas. And here we are talking about what is the one that comes out. <clears throat> um, so, so here it is, it is a kind of cinder lad part two. Here the cinder lad um, is the old fisherman. The act of going to the river every day, casting his net, is very reminiscent of um, the classical story uh, from uh, Middle Christianity, um, from the Arthurian uh, Celtic cycle, the, the Fisher King, the Fisher King, uh, which is something we do in in our healing. Even there, we don't. It, it's it's hard to get to, but um, it wouldn't be something for this this series. Uh, but in that series, in the Fisher King story, uh, what you do when you are in grief or when you are sort of comfortable with the process of grief is that you go fishing. Um, you go into the water, right? You're at the surface of the water, which is a symbol of the, the deeper emotional depths of yourself. And you fish, which is you cast a line, you basically send down a text saying, I'm ready to receive you and you wait, you wait, right? You wait for the wine to mature. You wait for the baby to gestate. You're not doing anything. You're waiting, you're holding space protective and whatever happened, whatever's happening is happening. You sit there and you wait for insights to come to you uh, from the depths. Uh, it's no accident that the Kingfisher bird is mentioned in the story. Fisher King and Kingfisher are related, not just because they're the same words um, transposed. Uh, even in the later Christian Catholic tradition, right? The popes 
uh, in the Catholic tradition, the Pope's head uh, hat is uh, the Pope's mitre, right? Has a notch on top of it. Uh, and the notch makes it, it's a, it's a salmon's head. The Pope's hat is a salmon's head because the, the salmon is the fish of wisdom. It's the exact same fish that the Fisher King is fishing for. Um, you know, the Pope's ring is the fisherman's ring. Jesus told the disciples, I will make you fishers of men. <clears throat> and so uh, all of this is related to the one that we are preparing the way for. Uh, the apostles being fishers of men, they are the John the Baptists, right? Christ is like a John the Baptist to all of us within that tradition. So at the beginning, the emerging inner masculine and feminine, the little boy and the girl, are found by this John the Baptist figure who keeps them, shelters them, and trains them. Just like Obi-Wan and Luke, just like uh, Morpheus and Neo, just like John the Baptist and Jesus. They come in a crystal cradle, which is reminiscent of the princess on the glass hill, the, the sort of insight that's frozen and not yet fully flowing and accessible uh, yet. Um, <clears throat> then just like in the previous story, there is the symbol of three. It's not plastered all over. Um, but is there, there is this triple level of progression through the story. Um, so there's a there's a three sort of trials, right? So the fisherman's older kids are badgering the boy and the girl. The multicolored, fabulous birds are badgering the little lowly white bird of truth, and the courtiers are badgering the king. Okay. And these are all parts of you, uh, the bully parts of you badgering this sort of um, lost board member kind of exiled part of you uh, in progressive levels. Uh, and to use the imagery of the previous story, uh, the brass level, right, the brass copper level, the silver level, and the gold level. Right, so you complete these trials, and then you go to the next trial, and then you go to the next trial. Um, so sometimes when we say, when we said earlier in the series, we talked about circumambulation <clears throat> and the nature of the healing process being two steps forward, one step back. You may say, well, you know, I've done all this therapy. I've done my time. I've done my grieving. Uh, am I done now? Can I go? Can I like have my fabulous, glamorous life now? And the answer is, well, yes and no. You've gotten past the bully older siblings. And now you've graduated to the next level where you need to get past, you know, the witch and the, the multicolored birds to get the bird of truth. And then if you've done that, uh, congratulations, you get to get, get to the next level where you like go to the king and need to get past the courtiers. And each time, because it's this similar kind of pattern, you're like, oh my gosh, am I a dunderhead? Have I, have I, am I back to square one? I have, I learned nothing. Uh, I, I promised myself I'd never date another person like that. And here I am, this person I didn't realize ended up being the same thing. Um, do I just suck at this, right? Uh, and the answer is no, right? It's not you're going in circles, it's a spiral, right? You're covering the same thing, but at a different level. Um, and and that's not this, it's not a consolation. It's like, no, 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 that's okay. You'll, you'll do it better next time. It's like, no, you've done it right. Like you got past the siblings and now you're getting past uh, the witch and the multicolored birds. And then you're getting, you, you're supposed to, there is no path straight up the spiral. This is the shortest way, this circumambulatory path, the labyrinth, right? The, like the labyrinth that sharp uh, cathedral in, in France is a symbol of this lifelong circumambulation. Uh, as we say in Silicon Valley, uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> um, okay. So in the three trials, these bullying parts of us all have uh, a single kind of shared characteristic which is they care primarily about prestige and validation. These are the profane parts of us that try to keep the sacred hemmed in. Just like in the regular world, the profane is always trying to keep the sacred hemmed in. Uh, bliss within you is a kind of bird of truth. It is sacred within you. Bliss is the thing that you like for no good reason. Uh, that, you know, and whenever you have this impulse to follow your calling for no good reason, uh, whether it's writing or art or um, healing, right? The first voice that tries to suppress it is how will you make money, right? Fear of poverty, threat, control, and fear of loss of validation from the outer world. Who's going to marry you? How are you going to raise kids if you're doing that and you're not making any money? 
So there's this lifelong bullying and pulling the wool over your eyes, lifelong struggle with your inner bullies. Even if you get past the first level, uh, there's a next level of bully <clears throat> to get through. And in real life, the way this plays out is often um, you're like, all right, no, I, I really am a writer. I'm going to be a writer, you know, um, uh, no matter who says anything, I'm just going to be a writer. And then the bully realizes like, okay, you've gotten away from the siblings. Now you're in front of the witch and the witch says, all right, you can be a writer, but you have to be a prestigious writer. You have to be a successful writer with lots of readers, fabulous, uh, you know, sort of bestseller list winnings, award winnings. Um, otherwise, right, you will have failed as a writer. And still, it's like they sort of take the thing that you know, you've, you've made it to the checkpoint, but you're not done. Right. The bully always has another trick up its sleeve. Um, but it's funny, it's kind of adorable that the trick is always the same trick. It's always the same trick. It's like fear of loss of prestige, loss of external validation, uh, mistaken for love, because validation is not obviously the same thing as love, right? So, um, so you can be a writer, but you have to be a prestigious one. And you fall for that trick too, not because you're a dunderhead, but because you're at the next level. And it's only at the end of the cycle. And here's the giveaway. Only at the end of the, at the highest level, the courtiers are so obsessed about making sure you don't write the thing you actually want to write. You don't play the music for your own sake, the music you like to play and not just for prestige. They're so chattering, these birds are chattering, right? They're so loud, overly loud that they tip forward, they go all the way too far in the circle, the wheel turns all the way back. And the king is like, what is this music you keep talking about that I shouldn't play? And all the courtiers are like, oh, shoot. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing to see here. <laughs> and it's like, the king is like, if there's nothing to see here, why are you running around in a tizzy, right? It's like, bring this music forward. I want to hear this music. And they're like, no, no, no. And, you know, it's it's the villain who goes too far. And then, uh, and that is not the mistake of the bully. That's the natural, you know, you go too far in order to come full circle. As we said, um, <clears throat> that quote from uh, William Blake, I think I we mentioned it last week, a fool who continues uh, with his foolishness will, you know, be, eventually become wise, right? You go too far and then you come back. Um, so then what happens, um, after grief then now note all these cycles, you know, and this is a long story. There's like a lot of stuff that, you know, the, the two kids go through and all this is, you know, in terms of the larger pattern after grief, this is like, after you've like come to terms with, you've had a loss and you sit with grieving. You, you go now, you never wash for 15 years, then you come up, uh, then you're kind of done, you take a breath, and then this like orphan child shows up out of nowhere, right? Uh, this little baby Luke Skywalker shows up out of nowhere, and you're like, okay, I have to sit in the desert, right? And from a distance, watch over this kid and make sure nothing happens to him. So you go into grief, wisdom rules the inner kingdom. And then what happens is you find this voice of truth. That's what happens after grief. You find this voice of truth. It's still, you know, a big fight. The three successive trials of tackling bullies, getting past the forces of profane in order to get to the sacred. And the sacred, these are all things we're unlike cleaning from the story, right? But it's consistent with other things um, we've said. Um, because all these, uh, the reason, you may be like in wonder, is like how come all these fairy stories from, the Celtic tradition, the Hindu tradition, the Native American tradition with, with Raven, um, the Spanish, the Northern European tradition. Uh, how come all these stories describe physics that are consistent across global human traditions? Uh, and the reason, I mean, was there like, you know, a single bar that went through and like miraculously influenced everyone? Did Homer like travel all over the world and spread like his way of thinking about it? That's kind of an improbable kind of brute force, you know, trying to brute force it into linear terms. Um, the reason you see all these similar patterns in physics all around the world, all throughout history, across human civilizations, is that, of course, for me, 
they're all describing. You know, they all are consistent in their description of what happens because they're all describing the same singular thing, right? It's like saying, if you're like, oh my gosh, how come everyone's study of heart and lungs is so consistent, even though they're, you know, in far flung places, there were, there were no spice routes, trade routes, they couldn't have possibly exchanged things. And yet their description of the heart and lungs is like very consistent, even across time and millenniums uh, and geography. And the reason of course, is like, they're all human. They all have consistently the same heart and lungs. So when we all look within, we find the same thing. We express it in different ways, different stories, but the underlying mechanics of what we're describing are the same because we share the same heart and lungs. We share the same biology. We share the same, another way of saying this is uh, being human itself is an archetype. To be human itself is an archetype. Uh, in advanced meditation, when we do that, we actually take the mask of being human as an archetype off as well and see what's behind that. Um, but being human itself is an archetype and it has its own um, patterns of consistency um, as anything would, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, and, and so one of the patterns we see here that we see in other stories is that the sacred, the voice of truth is not loud or conspicuous precisely because it is the voice of truth. It doth, it, it does not require, it does not need to protest too much, right? Just like in the last story last week, just like Cinder Light is quiet, he's not elbowing forward. He's already won the golden apples and he goes back and sits in the ashes because that's where he lives and he's comfortable there. And the king has to go out and look for him, right? And bring him back into uh, a sort of, uh, profane world as well, uh, to rain blessings down on the profane world as well. And so the way this voice of truth gets teased out gives us a clue of the physics of the dynamics within us. How do we tease out our own inner voice of truth? Um, and one of the things we learn here is we find it uh, after grief, um, which means uh, it's accessible anytime. Because as humans, like, which of you has not grieved, right? You may be like, oh my gosh, all this is happening after grief, so I have to go through more grief. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, potentially, but also it's like, you're, you're gonna sit there and tell me you're here listening to live sacred space, right? With me globally around the world, you know, 11 a.m. on the Sunday after Christmas, 2020. And you're gonna tell me you haven't grieved anything in your life. You're already there, right? You're already there. <clears throat> So this inner voice of truth within you is accessible because of all this um, at any time. Um, so the boy and the girl get past the siblings who finally shame them for being of the water, right? Uh, basically saying, you have no prestige, you don't belong here. So they leave. Uh, but the trick here is that while they are with the protector, the fisherman, uh, they acquire their superpower, which is speaking the language of the birds. So beautiful. Um, just like, so one of the characteristics of being with your John the Baptist is that you acquire a superpower, a totem, uh, a talisman, an amulet, uh, some object that gives you superpower. Uh, and here the superpower you gain when you are recovered after grief is that you have the power of speaking the language of the birds. And we'll talk about what that means. But you see this pattern over and over again. And even in Star Wars, just like Luke is with Obi-Wan, first thing, right off the starting blocks, he gets his lightsaber from Obi-Wan, his father's lightsaber, not from his father, from Obi-Wan. You recover your birthright through the John the Baptist figure, the advisor. Uh, there's a tradition in Christianity, Christ was trained by John the Baptist in you know, the sort of current Christian Bible, uh, the St. James Bible, which was agreed to right in the early 1600s. Um, they left out all the other sort of stories where you know, Christ went into training with John the Baptist. He went, you know, John Baptist didn't just baptize him. It wasn't just like he just showed up off the street and he baptized him. He was, there was training that was passed down. Um, and one of the things you get with the initiator is a skill. Um, 
So language of the birds here is an exquisite symbolism because birds and dreams are symbols of the spirit within you. Um, when you dream of birds, when you dream of the wind, they're interchangeable. Uh, angels, right? These are all uh, denizens of the air, which is symbolic of the spirit world. When you dream you're in a house, if you go down, that means one thing into the chthonic. Uh, if you dream you go upstairs to the second or third floor of the house, you're in a, uh, you see this, you hear these dreams all the time. You're in an elevator, you're going up to like the 55th floor of the penthouse, right? That is going up into the spirit realm uh, to deal, right? To like look for uh, the bird of truth, right? And to gain certain superpowers. So one of the marks, even in Judeo-Christian tradition, one of the marks of the savior and saints is that they can converse with birds and the wind. St. Francis of Assisi um, is a great example of this. In other words, they are symbolically, they are fluent in the language of the birds, of the spirit, right? Uh, the power, and for these children, the power of being comfortable conversing with the spirit is what gets them through, okay? Uh, and you see this in the in Cinderella. She could call on the birds to come in and pick out the lentils and give her the power of discernment. Uh, Odysseus could call on the winds. The Aeolian winds, would ended up, which ended up in disaster because he didn't watch the winds carefully enough. And other parts of him, like, you know, opened the bag of winds and he, he, he got sent back again. Uh, his own circumambulation. And, you know, the winnowing fan that we've talked about is, you know, the power of the wind and working with the power of the wind slash spirit. So what is this language uh, of the spirit? Is it meditating? Is it... Um, you know, juice fast, <laughs> is it yoga, right? Is it sleeping on a bed of nails and all this fancy stuff? Um, it's hard to put into words, but in a manner of speaking, I mean, you could say like the entirety of these 41 sessions, these several, you know, nine or 10 months of um, live sacred space uh, has been in part an attempt to teach you this language of the spirit where you go inward into your own inner kingdom uh, and without fear, threat, or control, you listen to everything and you sit with it until you are able to discern, right? Picking the lentils out, discern with the help of the spirit, the pattern of what is going on with you. Right? What is the archetype of what I'm in right now? Is, is it the artist? Is it the trickster? Is it something else? And when you see the pattern, instead of trying to exploit it, you sit with it until you come to understanding. Right? So in other words, um, I mean, a modern, very like horrifically profane attitude might be, oh, I've learned the language of the birds now. It's like a duck call. So I can call to the ducks and they'll come so I can shoot them and eat them for dinner. <laughs> right? That would be uh, an unfortunate use of the, the superpower of the language of the birds, right? And I could win awards as like the number one duck hunter. It's like, okay, uh, that probably wouldn't be the way to go. Another great detail here. Um, <clears throat> so, so basically you tend to the forces within you and the birds within you, not as dumb things for you to exploit in the pursuit of your prestige, which is fear, threat, and control. Uh, but you tend to them as family. Uh, and as the pantheon of forces within you to be reconciled with, to be recovered, and to collaborate with joyously in your bliss. Right? That's the ideal. Uh, let's see. So another great detail here is that not all birds are trustworthy. This is a very sort of uh, lovely, uh, uh, very real uh, text bit of texture of the story. Right? These. I mean, if you have the mythopoetic lens, these stories tell you everything, these, these, these um, deep, delicious details of life. So you're in the world of the spirit, and in the world of the spirit, not all birds, not all spirits, deal with you in good faith. So just because you're spiritual uh, doesn't mean you have to drop everything and go join the circus, right? Uh, just because you do spiritual things, you go to church, Right, there are, you know, as we've seen in the last 10 years, especially, uh, 
you know, there are forces in the church that you can't trust, right? There are uh, uh, individuals of authority in the church that you should not get into a car with, right? I mean, these, these kinds of things. Um, uh, even spiritual teachers, gurus, who become like these like sexual predators or whatever. Uh, cults, I mean, there's just countless examples. I, it's, I don't even need to sort of go into any specific. Um... So basically, at the, at the regular level, at the spiritual level, and at the chthonic level, there is still sacred and profane. Sacred and profane runs vertically through all the realms of reality. Not of good and evil, per se, but of fear, threat, and control versus no fear, threat, and control. Right? Versus no fear, threat, and control. And it is this issue of discernment, right? the winnowing fan, what we talked about before, uh, of which you will listen to. But the winnowing fan is of the Odyssey is not just this thing you wave around and you get like downloads, you get, you know, Athena comes and talks to you when you wave the winnowing fan around. The winnowing fan is the thing you plunge into the embodied, earthy, uh, material wheat, and then you fling it up with, you know, and the wheat, of course, comes from underground, right? All plants, all abundance, all nourishment comes from the chthonic, from underground. <clears throat> Gold, everything comes from underground. Uh, so those who are too spiritual, they they lose touch with this nourishment, right? Um, and it is all three realms working together that really gets you to, uh, um, you know, the, this power of discernment between the sacred and profane. And so it is this issue of discernment as to when you will listen to which one, sacred or profane. That's the key to discernment, right? So this echoes from the very first session we did 41 weeks ago. Where it's not that profane is bad and sacred is good. It's that it's a blend, right? You can decide. Uh, the only reason why people, I think, you know, in this day and age, take so much nourishment from something like this, this shared sacred space, is because where we find ourselves, you know, with no judgment, right? We, it's sacred, so it's no judgment. The way we find ourselves in the modern world is that it happens to be about 99% profane. Everything is fear, threat, and control. Uh, even spiritual stuff, you know, you better do your meditation or else, right? Um, so set a schedule, make sure your phone is buzzing at you to remind you to do these things. Um, and it, so it's 99% profane, 1% sacred. Uh, and what we say when we describe that is if you are okay with that state of affairs, carry on, no action needed, right? And if you're not, and you'd like to get more sacred for whatever reason, for no good reason, uh, we're providing that as a, as a form of comfort, right? And, um, you know, kind of service to the community. Um, so whether it's 90, 10, 50, 50, 10, 90, 30, 70, uh, you decide. You are the king and, and queen of your own inner kingdom. You decide how much you will listen to the courtiers. You decide how much you will listen to the white bird versus the peacocks, uh, the, the fabulous birds. Uh, and you decide how much you will listen to, um, how much you will drink from the multicolored water and how much you will drink from the pure clear water, right? You decide that and that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. The king in this story, has made his decision. He comes back from the war. The courtiers tell him this like fabricated story and he believes them, right? After the war, he doesn't even go to visit his wife in the castle where she's kept prisoner, where she's sick. And the wife obviously is, is, is the feminine, um, the actual feminine. We'll talk about her in a second. Uh, in the end, he chooses to rescue his wife when he has this breakthrough realization. But up to that point, he doesn't even visit her to say hi, right? And that is a choice he makes. He chooses to turn away from the sacred, to focus just on the profane of the courtiers. Um, and, you know, especially here in a venue like this in sacred space, I'm not going to tell you what ratio to choose. All I'm going to do is expose the physics of all of this, and then you make your own sovereign decision. Right? I'm not going to say the king was wrong and that you should you know, sort of not listen to the courtiers. I'm, the whole point of this is a symbolic diorama of the physics of 
a state of affairs that is so within you. Uh, and then you are always the sovereign of your own life and of your own inner world. You make the call. You make the call, right? And in sacred space, especially, I hold space for whatever call you make. I accept you as you are. So <clears throat> let's talk about this queen now. Another lovely detail is that the queen uh, that he married, that the courtiers didn't like because she wasn't prestigious. Why was she not prestigious? Because she was the daughter of a tailor. And we know from earlier stories that clothes are a symbol of embodiment and tailoring is its own kind of superpower. Right? One of the superpowers that the two uh, boys learned in that story, um, Gary, you can put the link up for that. Uh, uh, if I, I can't, I can't remember which one it was. Um, but it was the two sort of sons who were being uh, like killed. The father was trying to kill them because they ate the duck liver that they weren't supposed to eat. And they ran off. And one of the superpowers they learned from their John the Baptist, the one that took them in, was a tailor who learned, who taught them how to make clothes. Uh, and that is a symbol for embodiment. So they learned the power of embodiment, right? And here the superpower is the power of speaking the language of the birds. Um, you know, if you have all these different powers, embodiment, and you know, you can almost make a catalog go through of all the superpowers. And as you acquire these superpowers, you become a kind of, you know, a, a, an extraordinary kind of person, right? Um, so this queen is not the inner feminine of prestige, the courtiers, daughters but is the inner feminine of embodiment. You choose her for no good reason, out of pure desire in the beginning as the king, and then you lose her because the other parts of you barge in. They're more concerned with prestige, fear, control, threat, and they push her away exactly like the bright multicolored birds in the aviary, push the white bird into a corner. We're not saying, oh, you better avoid doing this. We're saying, this is what happens. Everyone does this. And it's not a question of if it's okay or not okay. I generally say it's okay. But it's like, like it or not, this is what happens. Uh, and then let's turn the wheel all the way around and see and play it out. How do we get back to uh, par? How do we continue all the way around and get up to that next uh, you know, sort of progressive level of circumambulation? Uh, for instance, you know, me, you may ask a question around now and say, well, already come on, you know, what's wrong with prestige, right? And what's wrong with wanting to be like a prestigious whatever? The point for me about prestige uh, is not that it's bad in and of itself. It's that it tends to be soaked with the qualities of fear, threat, and control. Um, and to the extent, if you want, you don't have to do this, but if you're like, my life is too much profane and not enough sacred, one of the huge, it's, it's like if you want to lose weight, right? And it's like, oh, you know, I'm like, you know, a diabetic, I want to lose weight. If you just cut like bread and wheat, right? That's like 80% of a typical person's like carbohydrate in, in, in the US anyway. Uh, so if you do that one thing, it's like, it's not everything, uh, but it's just a shorthand, you just gain uh, a lot if, if, that's, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, so prestige is like the sort of, you know, wheat gluten <laughs> of um, the profane and fear threatened control. Um, <clears throat> your typical <clears throat> upper middle class affluent family, uh, not just in the States, but the world over, right? <clears throat> Terrified of sliding into the middle class or the lower class, economically, socially. Terrified always of what the neighbors think, driving fancy cars, going on fancy vacations, not just to enjoy them, but it's like, because I have to. It's like, if we don't do our Hawaii vacation this year, in the winter, not the summer, because it's more prestigious in the winter and expensive, uh, then we'll have shame when we tell our friends after we come back, where did you go for vacation, right? So it's like, it's wonderful that you can go on these vacations, but at the same time, it's like, it's just tinged with fear, threat, and control. Um, that is, you know, sort of the overlord of that is prestige, fear of loss of prestige. So all these luxuries that you have actually worked your ass off for, right, worked really hard for and put up with a lot of crap for, uh, 
end up not being enjoyed, uh, but collected out of fear and turn the joys of life into ash in the mouth. Um, I mean, I went to uh, Harvard for university and I can't tell you like the number of other friends I met at Harvard. And this, we wouldn't say this, we, would we wouldn't dare to sort of say this to each other while we were there, but like decades later, you know, I'd be catching up with them. And as we would reflect, we would all reflect that there was so much expectation put on us that when we finally got our admissions letters uh, to Harvard or Stanford or wherever, outwardly, we would be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm the king of the world and you do your victory lap around and everything. But inwardly, it would not be so much enjoyment as it would be this feeling of relief, right? Like, oh my gosh, thank God I dodged that bullet. I get to keep my love for another four years because I got into Harvard. And then after that, we'll see what kind of job I get, if that's going to be good enough for mom and dad or, or whoever it is I'm answering to, right? Um, so even the sort of the elite top of the top, it's like they're all running for their lives, right? Out of fear, threat, and control. And this is the exact same thing you hear in the Fisher King story, where his wound uh, is such that you know, so the Fisher King lives in the Grail Castle, right? There's this like Grail, the Holy Grail, um, that the Christians have taken to mean like sort of the uh, the, the cup of the Last Supper of Jesus. But it, it was the Grail itself is a pre-Christian concept, um, and the idea is that at the feast uh, in in the Grail Castle, the Grail will appear to each guest, and when the Grail appears, you can tell it all of your heart's deepest desires and it will be laid out before you on the table and you will feast. And the Fisher King, the King of the Grail Castle bears this wound that is so unhealable. Even the Grail cannot heal it. And every night at the feast, when he goes uh, to tell the Grail what he wants, everything he actually wants is before him. And when he eats, uh, the food turns to ash in his mouth, uh, which is also a grieving symbol. Right, so, so when you're in grief, even the magical silver bullet of the grail does not heal you. Something else has to heal you, which is a whole other, that's not the story we're telling today, that's a different story. Um, so all the luxuries uh, when you are sort of in the grip of prestige uh, are not actually fully enjoyed, but collected, amassed out of fear, threat, and control, and the joys of life turn into ash in the mouth. Um, and when you're in this state, I'll just share this one other detail. Um, in the text of uh, the Grail, I think it is the uh, von Eschenbach version, the German version. Uh, there's a line in the Fisher King story, which is just so, so touches the jugular of what we're talking about here, uh, where uh, it describes the state of the king. And this one line description is that the king uh, was agonized you know, by his wound. Uh, the grail was not able to heal him. And he spent every day of like uh, 20 or 30 years in this state where he was too ill, um, too ill to live, but unable to die. Too ill to live, but unable to die. Um, which in modern terms, in our popular culture terms, uh, what is too ill to live but unable to die? It's a zombie, right? It's a zombie. Uh, so all this, when the zombie movies were like all the rage about you know, several years ago, I was looking at it mythopoetically and I was like, this is an interesting reflection of the state of, you know, the, the spirit of our body politic, right? Um, and so, um, so when you are soaked in this profane realm, you have nice things around you, but you don't enjoy them. What do you lose in this realm? What have you lost when you find yourself in a realm like this? Uh, well, the first thing is uh, you've lost the boy and girl, the inner masculine, inner feminine emerging of embodiment. You've lost that superpower. Um, you lose your power of embodiment. You don't know how you feel anymore. You don't know what you actually like or don't like. All you know is what you're supposed to like, right? I don't know if I actually like Hawaii, 
right? I don't know if I actually like driving this car. All I know is what I'm supposed to like. And I better wear the watch and I better wear the costume. I better get on a certain kind of, have a certain background with my Zoom calls or whatever, or else. And that wagging finger is the thing I answer to, not my own inner desire. Uh, should I marry this person? Should I take this job? I don't know, right? Uh, and all right, so you end up marrying a person who may not be right for you. You end up doing a career path uh, that may not be right for you. So you've lost your power of embodiment uh, and and related to that, your power of, it, of discernment because discernment requires this embodiment. Uh, you've allowed the courtiers and the bright birds to drown out the voice of the deeper you. Goes without saying. And then the other thing you lose is this voice of the bird of truth. You can't hear your own inner truth anymore. So you lose all these things when you get into this state, uh, which is a normal part of the cycle of human life. If you're like, oh my gosh, she's describing my life right now. It's like, that's okay. Keep chilling. It's okay. This is normal. This is normal. Everybody gets to this point. Okay. Uh, so you lose all these things. And the question is, how do you get it back? One of the things that um, I kind of skipped over in the brainstorm and then Gary like, like pulled me back into was this idea of uh, the owl uh, and the word cross. Right? So as you progress through the story, most of the birds can't speak human. They can speak one human word, cross. And then the bird of truth is fluent in both languages. Right? Um, so the word cross to me signifies crossroads. Here you have a bird of wisdom, the owl, and the kathana, because the owl is not a solar uh, being uh, of the spirit. It is a kathana, uh, and an owl is nocturnal, it hunts it and, and is awake at night. Uh, in the olive tree, right, I kid you not. So the olive tree obviously is the totem of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and cunning. Uh, the patron goddess of Odysseus, uh, and her totem uh, plant is the olive tree, what she gifted to the Athenians uh, and made the Athenians name the city after her. Uh, when I was in Athens uh, two Octobers ago, uh, I don't speak Greek, and one of the things I discovered was that um, in Greek, you don't call Athens, Athens. You call it Athena. You don't call it the city of Athena. You call it Athena. The city is literally her name. She and the city are one, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and I was also shocked to learn that, like, you can't go anywhere in Greece to sacrifice to Athena. It's all Christian. I mean, it has been for hundreds of years, but I'm like, so if I want to just, you know, offer a handful of frankincense on the altar to Athena. I can't do that in Greece. And my friends were like, what are you talking about? We don't do that. I'm like, okay. So uh, the olive tree, the owl, all associated with Athena. So here, this bird of wisdom tells you not to listen to the seeming feminine authority, the witch, the Baba Yaga. And at the crucial point, this is the crossroads. Uh, you need to turn away from the colored fancy water that you've been sent to get and get the clear, uh, unfancy water, the spring water, uh, that's coming from the rock, not from the fountain. And even go so far as to speak untruth to the witch by, by saying, here's the colored water you wanted, and it's not actually, and you have to lie. Um, and so the question this begs is, whoa, these are all inner parts of me. And this owl is telling me I can't trust the witch and they're both parts of me. So who do I trust? Right. Uh, it's just like going into the aviary. Do I trust the color birds? Do I trust uh, the, the white bird cowering in the corner? And so the question of the owl who says cross crossroads is that is the critical crux, the cross, the crux um, of the story, which is the question of can you trust this owl? And the boy does, and he makes the correct um, decision, right? Uh, and this question of discernment is a question of how do you read the signs? Um, I mean, the witch is the crone. The crone is wisdom. 
the owl's wisdom, they're saying opposite, opposite things. Whom do I listen to? And, and, and why or how does this boy make the right decision? And the reason he makes the right decision, or he can, the reason he has this discernment is because he is the child of embodiment. He is the son of the queen who is the daughter of the tailor. So embodiment is the thing that pulls you through. As we've said before, the body never lies. Fancy intellect, oh, spiritual this or that, right? Uh, that can lie because, I mean, we've talked about this in the Tao Te Ching talk and everything. Anything that uses words can lie. Um, and the body doesn't use words. Uh, so it, I mean, it wouldn't lie, but it doesn't lie, right? The body comes at you with raw feeling that you can maybe name and then some person will say, no, 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 that's not really this, it's actually that. So you can haggle over what it is. But the feeling in you, the feeling in you doesn't change. Right? The feeling is the feeling. Um, and part of the trick of the industrialized, commercialized, profane world to get you to stay in the profane and not go into the sacred is to cut you off from your bodies. Right? Um, so anyway, there's more I can say there, but I, I think you get the point of what I'm saying. So he is the child of embodiment. So he can tell that he can trust this voice. Um, and the other detail is, you know, he leaves the sister behind and the boy himself goes forward. So the emerging inner masculine embodiment is the one that moves forward and does all the action in this part of the story. And the reason for that is it's not a sexist thing, right? You have uh, the girl is a part of you, the boy is a part of you. The inner masculine uh, is the part of you that we've always say is in charge of boundary control, protection, and manifestation. So he's the one that goes out and exercises all this discernment under the sort of uh, presiding, right, uh, of the inner feminine who gives the vision and nourishment. So, um, so when the time comes, he's the one that does it effectively. Uh, the multicolored water is interesting because it's a fountain. Uh, just like the bright work, it's bat dazzling, shooting up, you know, rainbow colors. Uh, but it's the wrong choice. It's the wrong choice. And the fact that it's multicolored, uh, not fragrant, not whatever, really struck me because it evoked the colors of the seven chakras. Right. So that's that talk I did where I went through all the different colors and levels and symbolism of the chakras. And when you have a wheel that has slices of the seven colors, right, in a wheel, and you spin this wheel, when they blend, what you see is white light. So the seven colors blend and integrate into white light. So the multicolored fountain is the lack of integration between you know, these different parts of you, where you get stuck in like, oh my gosh, my desire, or how am I gonna make money? Or um, how do I speak my truth? And you like really get stuck there, right? Um, and when you realize it's not a progression where I'm out and I'm done, but it's a ribbon, right? It's a cycle and you like are happy to go through one, two or three times with the siblings, with the birds, with the courtiers. And you're like, that's fine. That's just the way it is. Oh, you know, there's my Manipura chakra three again. There's my desire chakra again, um, that I had finally thought I had conquered just a couple of years ago. And now it's back again. And that's okay. So when you go around in a cycle, the light you see is not multicolored, it's white. It's the pure white light. And that's the one you need. Um, white is a color, is the color of reconciliation of the seven colors. Uh, and you're always the white and you're always the seven colors at the same time. So the guidance here is almost like to not be bedazzled by the colors, but to get to the bird of truth, you want the clear water, uh, the white light, the white bird, uh, who also is not loud. It's not this spring fountain. It's like this little babbling sort of spring on the side uh, coming out of the rocks. Um, and just like Boots and Cinderlad, who has the golden apples, but he's the one hiding in the back. Right? Uh, this, this aspect of the physics comes up again and again. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, so the, I guess the last thing I'll say here is that so the thumbnail here is that in exile, uh, under the protection of your John the Baptist, which is within you, um, 
you learn the language of the birds and spirit. Uh, you become a bit spiritual perhaps, and you acquire the ability to reflect within you, right? Not to show off to people, it's like, oh, you know, I experienced this in meditation, let me tell you about the retreat I did. Uh, that's part of it, that's fine. But the real language of the birds is within you, where you learn to ask your inner world, parts of your inner world questions, and you have the ability to sit and hold space for what you may hear back. Just like Raven in the dark saying like, this will not do. And he sits quietly and the answer comes, okay, go to the hut and that's where, you know, the golden ball is. Um, so you learn this ability to reflect this language of the birds, this ability to sit in the sacred and to receive. Uh, how do you learn this language of the birds? Uh, so the words which are inadequate, self-reflection, sacred and profane, mythopoetics, uh, all of this is related to the language of the birds, but that's not all. Once you've gained that power, then you go on your next stage of adventure, which is to go out and look for the bird of truth and to discern between the voices of bad faith and good faith, the voice of truth within you. Um, even in the spiritual, there is profane and sacred. Even in the spiritual, there is good faith and bad faith. The voices of bad faith are profane. Uh, those are the voices. And, you know, just with the definitions we've set up, it's basic physics of it. The voices of bad faith are profane. So what's profane? Fear, threat, and control. So the voices within you that ply you and harangue you with fear, threat, and control are the voices of bad faith. They threaten you, you cave to the threat, and they lead you astray, and they hide the voice of truth within you. Who doesn't threaten, right? Cinder lad doesn't say, you know, fools, I've got the golden apples, you need to come deal with me. He just goes back into the ashes. The king needs to go looking for him. He scours the kingdom, he doesn't step forward, right? Uh, because he doesn't threaten. He's just there, right? Um, and the third clue is this power of embodiment. The thing you are trying to restore through this whole story are the children of the queen, the, the inner feminine vision uh, of embodiment. Uh, the good news is that once you know how to get back into your body, uh, that's half the battle right there, right? Um, and as we've discussed before, you know, the key, one of the keys to, embod to embodiment is to slow down. Uh, the mind moves faster than the body. The mind can move faster, slow. The body can only move at its pace. Uh, so the way you get them in line is you just slow down. Um, and in the modern world, to slow down is like the first cardinal sin. <laughs> right? It's like, you're not busy? What do you mean you're not busy? Uh, you're not working hard? What do you mean you're not working hard? Um, slowing down, uh, you can almost say that slowing down is like the first cardinal sin because it leads to like the ultimate, ultimate cardinal sin, which is going back into your body, right? Uh, not to traffic it for how hot it is on Insta or social media or whatever, but just to go into your body to, uh, accept it without condition, however it is, uh, and to hear what it says to you through feeling, not through words. Um, then at that point, you feel slash hear your inner voice of truth, right? Your body tells you what voice within you is the right voice. Um, and then when you realize it, it, so how does this happen in real life? You get to this point and then you realize there's this little voice in your head that you realize was always there. And you finally have ears to hear. And it's like, what is the voice saying? The voice is saying, I don't feel safe with this person. The voice is saying, I don't like this career path I'm on. The voice is saying like, I don't like how I'm living my life right now, the current direction of my life I am not okay with. And all the other birds come in and say, well, you know, what if you do, what are you gonna blow up all this stuff and what are the neighbors gonna think? And it's like, after all this, you have the power to say, hang on just a minute. Like, we'll get to all that later the white bird is talking. Please continue. 
And the white bird is like, okay. Um, Because I'm fine to shut up. It's like, no, no, please, please continue. And it will go on and on and tell you everything. And then, you know, the courtiers, like all the color drains from their faces. (laughs) They're like, oh, hell, you know, now what are we going to do? And in a very quiet voice of a very small bird in a corner, uh, this wisdom, this truth, your inner truth issues out. But when you hear it, you know that it's true. That's why it's so terrifying. Uh, so in a thumbnail, that's that's how you get back to, uh, what was the title of this again? That's how you find your inner truth. <laughs> uh, and that's it. That's all the notes I had. Gary, are you still there? Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I to. Like, it's just uh, so much packed into this story. And what I... I tripped over so many parts of it, too. Yeah, and what I what I loved about it is that the the majority of the story actually deals with the nature of the the white bird that speaks the truth and and where it is and how to find it and what what happens with it. But there are these tiny tiny details which you can you can just ignore and walk past it, but when you find it it's like finding these hidden gems. This one detail of course is that the queen is uh, the daughter of a tailor, right? Mm. And there you kind of pick up the clue that, that we're talking about embodiment here. And the fact that she's shut up in a tower in the mountains and, you know, she's never seen the light of day. I mean, there's just so much meaning stuffed in there in that just that one line which says the king married the daughter of a tailor, right? Mm. And then there's this tiny little right. detail totally. at the beginning which gives us the clue that, like you picked up, that the old fisherman is John the Baptist kind of figure, the mentor, initiator kind of figure, is that he would, while he cast his nets and waited for the fish, he would listen to the song of birds. And he kind of then Mm, know that the kids then also picked up the same thing when they went to the riverside and sat and kind of, you know, threw crumbs to birds, learn mm. skills from them and and the other detail that i've really loved is the skills that the birds taught the children is to wake up early mm. and to sing mm. and to, to talk the language of birds mm. so i'm like okay so you, you all of these are just so much about you know the voice and and uh, listening and and engaging with that with that world. Like, mm. what are, what is the dynamics of engaging with your inner, um, you know, in a bird world, mm. and also kind of be able to express yourself in a song. And we've mm. done a whole song motif, uh, you know, I think in multiple stories about singing your song. Um, what mm-hmm. happens when you stuff down your song and all of that. So mm-hmm. I found that fascinating that there are these just tiny little details hidden in, in the story, um, like side themes as well, which don't take the center stage, but are equally important clues. Mm. Yeah, there's just something to all this where <clears throat> it's making me think of um, just the density, as you say, right, of all this insight packed into uh, a single symbol. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because these stories are not alphabetic, they're not linear, they're they're imagistic, Mm. right? So it's it's this image of like being the children of the daughter of a tailor. It's just a single holistic image that you can spool out if if you spend time like this to sort of do it. Yeah. Uh, But the image hits you at a deep level as well. Mm. And it often reminds me of the story, not the story, but just this, this school of thought that, um, you know, in Christianity, right, mm-hmm. all of these stories, the parable of the loaves and fishes, the walking on water and uh, the crucifixion and the passion, mm-hmm. all of these are fairy tales themselves. Um, mm-hmm. But depending on the Christian tradition you're in, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the Hebrew tradition has this, the, the Muslim Islamic tradition has this as well. But he, you can say in a sense, using the words we've used here, that <laughs> many of the religious traditions have been profaned. 
-hmm. and they profane because it's like if you read any of the parables of even the new testament it's like you can read them like this mm -hmm. um but somehow the middle management of like 2000 years of clergy has boiled it all down to like you better love jesus or else you're going to burn in hell and i'm like that's mm. that's allegory for you <laughs> that's allegory and clergy the world over across i'm not just yeah. you know all clergy sort of behave like that because uh they are the if anything the priests of the profane of fear threat and control or you mm. better do this or else there's nothing wrong with that but there's always a sacred side of all of these traditions um and you know it, it's a very fraught thing uh, in any of these, especially the Abrahamic sort of religions, like Shia, mm -hmm. Sunni, and, you know, there's always a tradition that's very legalistic, and it's like, do this or else. Mm -hmm. And then there's another tradition where it's like, we don't need priests, we can just commune directly with God, and, you know, mm -hmm. all hell breaks loose, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess what I'm saying is this is not something that um, I think is my bliss to do, but it was often said that uh, Carl Jung right, mm -hmm. could have single-handedly revived Protestant Christianity mm -hmm. uh, into this broad whatever, but that the, you know, sort of multicolored birds of the establishment okay. said, no, 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 and so, sort of chased him out and said, you know, you can't read these things. Okay. Um, symbolically, you have to read them allegorically, and you know, mm -hmm. we have to stay in this realm of fear, threat, and control. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know why that's coming to me now, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I mean, in the world of, of the profane and mm -hmm. uh, religious kind of, you know, the religious profane, mm -hmm. it is a very sort of provoking thing to say in any kind of official capacity that, mm -hmm. oh, the Christ is within you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like, People either like lose their minds and they're like, no, 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 that's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, or squawk, or they say, oh yeah, Christ is within me, all is one, everything, and they go in the opposite direction and it just diffuses into this disembodied spiritual mm -hmm. platitude. Um, and the real traction where the rubber meets the road is like in between that. And I think the beauty of that is that it it happens within you. Yeah. You know, like zero minute meditation, when I teach that to kids, one of the things, well, when I'm pitching it, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm gonna teach you a kind of meditation where, uh, you know, you don't have to sit still with your eyes closed for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And everyone, all the like five-year-olds in the classroom look at each other and are like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, what? wait, wait, there's more, but wait, there's more. And they're all like, hang, and all the teachers are like, how did you get them to like be quiet for so long? And I'm like, I'm like giving the people what they want. And like, yeah. but wait, there's more. Not only do you not have to sit still for 20 minutes, if you like it and you want to do it, mm -hmm. nobody knows you're doing it. Yeah. So if mom says like, I don't like that already, woo, don't do his meditation. You can be like, okay, mom, I won't do it. And you could be doing it and she won't know. <laughs> Or it's like, if you're like, no, I like Artie Wu, you better do that meditation. Um, mm -hmm. You absolutely have to do it. It'll be good for you. And I command you to do it right now. And you could be like, okay, dad, I'm doing it. And you actually <laughs> not doing it. And he won't know. Yeah. Because, you know, as a five-year-old, it's important to me that you have sovereignty. Yeah. And um, anyway, the loophole through all this is what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. these processes that happen, this recognition of the Christ within you, Right, or whatever it is, this new mm -hmm. sort of thing that comes to Luke, the Neo in you, mm -hmm. is internal. Yeah. It's internal. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you do it, when you have these realizations, uh, nobody has to know. Yeah. And you still have the full milk of the nourishment that comes from it. And nobody can take that away from you. Uh, and that's what I, I, that's why I love that. I love that. Yeah. Part of it. <laughs> It just occurred to me when you were saying this that it's amazing how even the physics of what you just said is when you say, okay, it's 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 a thing within you and it's sacred and and all of that. When you say that, there are all these voices outside that just go nuts about it and mm -hmm. try to say, no, 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 that's that's not how it is. Even that physics is is kind of put into the story where 
you know, the older siblings tell these two orphans that you don't have a mother and father. You have, you're of the river. And therefore, because you are of the river, you're like toads and frogs. Right. And right. that's so telling is because if you're off the water, mm. it's just the profane will just tell you, if you come from the water, you have to be a frog. I mean, you right. can't be a water nymph. You can't be a water goddess. You can't be the river goddess. I mean, you have to be a frog. Right. right. <laughs> so right there, it's like the, the cutting of uh, anything that comes from, from the inner inside or inner water. Well, also the other thing that's coded in that is that you don't have a mother and a father, you're from the water. And it's like, you know, on this, like two days after Christmas now, it's like, so what you're saying is, right. I am immaculately conceived. Yeah. <laughs> like, Cause the immaculate conception is that this yeah. thing springs out of you. It's yeah. anahata, right? It's yeah. not hit. It's the sound that's made not yeah. from two things hitting that is beyond cause and effect. Yeah. It is this power within you. This mm -hmm. seeing, this power of speaking with the birds, this power of all of these powers that spring mm -hmm. out of you spontaneously, not caused. Yeah. Uh, just like desire and bliss are the things that spring out of you that are mm -hmm. not caused. I didn't choose to be a healer, right? Yeah. If I were in the profane and I could choose my bliss, maybe I'd choose my bliss to be like, I don't know, a casino magnet or a hedge fund manager. <laughs> but you don't get to choose your bliss. Um, yeah. uh, it just springs out of you with no cause and your only choice is to follow it or not. Yeah. yeah. That's lovely. So what's what the else? exercise what this week? What, 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 what do we think about? What do we okay. Think? Um, yeah. Okay, so we've got a few minutes. So the exercise we came up with, and again, as always, principle number four of Presidian Sacred Space, no expectation of participation. You don't have to do this exercise. It's only if you want. Uh, but if you want, between now and next Sunday, uh, or anytime, uh, you can do this exercise uh, sometime when you have five or 10 minutes uh, alone in your home. If your home is kind of a zoo right now, if you're driving out to get groceries, uh, as you park the car before you go in, you can sit an extra five or 10 minutes. And with some pen and paper, you sit uh, and you ask yourself a couple of questions uh, with regard to the story. And so the exercise for this week, only if you want, is to ask yourself and write the answers out. Where is your voice of truth? And what is it saying to you? Now, how do you find your voice of truth? Now, if we were doing a retreat or a full program, we'd, we'd do this over in steps over like several days, probably. Um, ideally on some beach in Santorini or, <laughs> or in Bali, right? Uh, maybe after COVID. But for now, this is a big question. Uh, uh, but this is also the story that Gary's muse has given us. So let's just hit it here. So the exercise is where is your voice of truth and was it, what is it saying? Uh, and to find out when you're sitting in your car five or 10 minutes, you would do these things. Uh, and I'm pulling these things right from the story, right? It's not my wisdom or I'm just pulling these things right out of the story we just told and I'm just summarizing them in executive summary form for your convenience. Number one, you embody, uh, you slow down. I mean, even the act of like parking before you go in for groceries and like just sitting there for 10 minutes is slowing down, okay? Slow down, uh, touch your face, touch your body, become aware of your body in the car. Uh, you can move around in your seat, feel your body against the seat of the car, feel the feeling of um, the fabric of your shirt on your skin. Sit still, feel the air on your cheek. And as you breathe, you feel the air passing over the skin uh, of your nostrils. The breath rising and falling in your chest. Um, so this is not running or doing yoga later. This is like in the car now. Okay. So that's number one. 
you do a little something to embody. Um, now, those of you who, I mean, if you're even doing this now, uh, only if you want, you may experience this and you'll be like, this feels like the sacred. Um, and it is because the tendency when you embody is that you are devoid of fear, threat, or control. Okay. Uh, some of you may also say this feels like the present moment. Uh, and it is um, because when you embody, you drop into the now. It's the present moment and embodiment are one and the same. Uh, the sacred and embodiment are basically one and the same. Okay. So that's number one. Uh, and uh, number two of two, so the second thing, is while you're in this state uh, of embodied, just sitting around, the question to ask is, what is currently the shiniest, multicolored, loudest thing in your life? The biggest lore, the biggest threat, if you don't get it. The thing that demands all your attention with fear, threat and control, fear of loss of prestige, fear of loss of money, of impending poverty, health threat, all of it. The biggest multicolored thing. And what you do with this biggest multicolored thing is you don't stuff it down, you don't, you know, you it's big for a reason, you're gonna need it. But just for 15 or 20 seconds, you take it, you say, be right back. Don't freak, I'm just gonna put you on the shelf over here and just look away where, you're where it's not covering the entire field of your vision for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, not too long, just a little bit. And during that 15 second window, you ask yourself, what else is it that I see when this huge multicolored thing is out of my way? It's hard to do this when you're not in an embodied state. What is the stupid, simple part of me saying? Not the shiniest, multicolored, loudest thing, but what is the simplest cinder lad, little white bird cowering in a corner? Uh, what is it saying? Now, when it speaks quietly in a whisper, what that means is it could be a thought in the back of your mind. It might not be a thought at all. It could just be a feeling, a sort of nagging feeling that you've had, slightly irritating that you like currently brush off without even thinking about it. That is your voice of truth. That is your voice of truth. Uh, if you hear it and then you have an immediate stab of like, oh, no, 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 hell no, not that, not that. That is the confirmation that that is it. Because when you have that stab of like, oh, hell no, that's when the multicolored birds flock in and try to sort of shimmy it out of your sight, out of the king's sight. When the multicolored birds squawk and protest and threaten, you know you are listening to the to be uh, to the voice of truth. Um, and that's it, that's just something to try. Now the point here is you may be like, oh, that's really hard, that's really advanced. It's like, yeah, this will take practice. Uh, you may go down into there five or six times and each time you come up and you're like, I didn't hear anything. And it's like, that will be normal, that's okay. Um, but what I just described, we would take if we were on a retreat, you know, two or three days. Uh, and I wouldn't even be telling you this is what we're doing. We'd be like coming at it from different angles, right? Um, but this would be touching what I've just described is basically touching the jugular of it, the essence of it. Um, and if you're not ready, you're like, I can't do it. Uh, that's okay. What the story is, is we, we see it in the overall arc which is this is the thing you endeavor to do after you have cooked in grief, never wash 15 years, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you're like, I can't quite get there. I, I'm worried about this. I, I still think about prestige. I'm a, I'm a terrible person. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm a dunderhead. It's like, no, no, no. 
This is the thing you do after you're in grief, in exile. Uh, and you gain, you don't gain the power of the birds here, you gain the power of the birds, the power of embodiment in the cooking process of grief. Grief is the thing that gives you all these powers, as we've said in past sessions. Um, but we already talked about that, right? So we're talking about now this, I don't know if it's advanced, it's like it's cyclical. So it's this part that we go back to again and again. Uh, and it may feel advanced because we're like, we're often in the cycle, we're stuck here going like, I'm not jumping out of the plane. Uh, I don't want to go into grief. I don't want to go into grief. When you finally go, you go all the way through. We're, we're getting into the depths of like what's after that. And then you come back around again for the next, for the next cycle. Uh, and that's just, um, that's what it is. Uh, as outlined by all of these um, lovely fairy tales. Okay. So that's it. That is the exercise. Um, and so I think now what we'll do next is we'll go ahead and close the session. Um, so our next session uh, will be Sunday again. Uh, I think the day after, two days after uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Uh, it's free. It's open to the public. Please invite others uh, only if you want. I will throw the link to sign up here in Crowdcast and here in Facebook. Okay. Um, and then uh, so uh, I hereby close the session of our shared sacred space. Thank you for holding this space uh, with us. And thank you for sharing the nourishment, the emotional nourishment and the spiritual nourishment of uh, our shared sacred space together, all together with us. Uh, I give you my blessing. Go in peace, bestowed with blessing, free of fear, free of threat, and free of the undue control of others. Have a great day, have a great week, and I will see you all in the next session. Thank you. Thank you.